Cherokee Trail. We are back for chapter 10 of Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus. I hope you're enjoying it so far. We are at the point where Avon has been at school for a mm, couple days. And in the last chapter, she decided to go ahead and eat in the library. And it turns out she met someone who didn't just stare at her awkwardly and then not include her. So I think things might be a little on the upswing. His name was Connor. And if you remember, he also has um, uh, something that makes him feel uncomfortable around others, which is Tourette's syndrome, which can manifest itself in different ways. But for him, it makes him, he um, just has some sounds that come out that he can't necessarily control. And uh, he's not doing it just to be funny. It's just the way it is. And um, and he's like super honest with Avon. He like talks to her about right off. He doesn't ignore the fact that she doesn't have arms. And if you're like me, sometimes you don't know if the person wants you to ask about well, however they're differently abled or if they want you to just act like it's no big deal. And um, at least in this story, it seems like Avon wants you to sort of ask questions, not like pretend it's not there. So, um, sort of interesting. She's going to talk a little bit about it in this next chapter, too. So here we go, chapter 10. On Sunday af afternoon, I wrote another blog post. When you have a malformation, yuck, I hate that word, like I do, you definitely have to deal with the usual looks. The most popular look I get is the one I like to call the I'm so cool, nothing faces me, not even your missing arms look. These are the people you pretend they don't notice my missing arms. You could also call this the sure I'm totally used to seeing people with no arms look or the I have tons of armless friends look. These people are just way too blase about it. I mean come on you really don't notice my missing arms because I can tell you do by how you refuse to look at my torso, like the whole sun is sitting on my chest. Just go ahead and look, for goodness sake. Look and ask questions if you want. These people try way too hard. Then there's a look I like to call, oh my gosh, I'm staring in your armless area. Just kidding, no, I'm not. N now I'm staring, no, I'm not. These are the people I can clearly see staring at me out of the corner of my eye, but as soon as I look at them, they look away. Seriously, people, you're not fooling anyone. Just keep on staring. It's okay to be curious. Everyone is. There's also the dreaded pity look. Oh, you poor thing with no arms look. These people not only look at me, but they give me a pitifully sad smile when I make eye contact with them. They should save those looks for starving homeless orphans. Being armless isn't that bad. And then there's the worst look of all. I have to deal with it because it almost always comes from little kids who haven't learned manners yet. It's the, I can't stop staring at you because you're a freak look. Sometimes these looks end in screams and kids running away. I stopped typing. The post sounded all lighthearted and ha ha funny, but I didn't write that I ignore these looks to the best of my ability. I didn't write that I pretend they don't bother me, but even after 13 years of seeing them, they still hurt. I also didn't write that the last time I got one of these looks was just the day before while I was grocery shopping with mom. Mom likes to take me grocery shopping with her. She says it's because I need to learn how to grocery shop on my own, but I really think it's because she likes having a child slave to command. So mom basically makes me handle all the groceries in the store. I have to get the canned tomatoes from the bottom shelf, the soy sauce from the top shelf. I'm so flexible, it would blow your mind. The cereal from the middle shelf, the bag of apples from the produce department. We go with bag produce, so I'm not putting my feet all over the fresh food in front of people. And yes, even the rotisserie chicken. The rotisserie chicken was sort of a disaster, but that's not the point of this story. The fact that it takes us three hours to grocery shop isn't the point either. 
Sometimes I wish mom had some other hobbies besides teaching Avon how to do stuff. So I was in the cereal aisle trying to slide this box of corn puffs out from the shelf with my foot. I had just finally gotten it wedged between my head and shoulder, but as I stood up and turned to drop it into the cart, I caught the little girl standing in the aisle giving me the dreaded, I can't stop staring at you because you're a freak look. I stared back at her for a moment. You got a problem with corn puffs, I said. Her mom's head shot up from reading the label on a box of instant oatmeal. She saw what was going on and grabbed her cart and daughter and scurried away. I acted all cool, like I couldn't have cared less about it, but I still remember it happening. I remember every time it happens. When I was done writing my post, Dad asked me to help him put some fresh paint on the flat wooden picture standing by the front entrance of the park, the kind with cutouts people can stick their heads through for photographs. I seriously doubted anyone took pictures from the faded wooden figures, but I agreed to go with him because I'm such a good daughter. I could see why he wanted to freshen them up. The paint was so faded you could hardly tell what they were anymore, and one of them looked like you were sticking your head through a giant boob. Not exactly the family-friendly image we were going for. Dad put a chair out for me to sit on while I painted with my foot. My painting skills aren't exactly the finest, but I can manage large, simple pictures. Just don't expect me to paint your portrait unless a stick figure is acceptable. As I worked on turning the boob back into a small hill with a barrel cactus on top of it, I saw Connor walking over the bridge that connected the parking lot to the park. The bridge was built to go over a wash. Washes are like empty riverbeds that run all over North Scottsdale so that when it rains, the water can flood the city in an orderly manner. Connor didn't have to go through a kiosk or anything like that as he entered the park because admission was free. All the money was made from paying for the many attractions we had, <laughs> if you could call them that. Hey, Connor, I said as he walked up to me, barking a few times on his way. You came. Hi, Avon, he said, looking around, squeezing his hands together. There aren't very many people here. Oh, this place is always dead, I told him. Connor seemed relieved. Dad looked up from painting the gun in a cowboy's hand. I had thought it was a sea cucumber, but a gun made a lot more sense. Why would the cowboy be pointing a sea cucumber at people as they entered the park? And where would a cowboy in the middle of the desert get a sea cucumber from anyway? Who's this, Avon? Dad asked. Dad, this is Connor. We met at school. Dad reached out his hand and Connor shook it. Nice to meet you, Connor. Do you mind if I take a break, I asked Dad. He looked at my handiwork so far. It definitely looks less boobish, so I guess you're free to go. I handed him my paintbrush, slipped my shoes back on, and walked off with Connor down Main Street. Connor suddenly chuckled beside me. It's just so cool that you live here. I scowled at the comment. So what have you been up to? Oh, nothing. My mom's gone working all weekend, and I got tired playing video games, so I thought I'd walk over and see if you were here. It made me feel good that he had come here just to see me, especially since he had mentioned not liking to go out a lot. I like to play video games. He looked surprised. Really? Yes, I said, annoyed at his look of surprise. I can play. I bet I could kick your butt at just about any game. Are you challenging me? Because pretty much all I do when I'm at home is play video games. I'm like a professional video game player. We'll just see about that, I said. Does your mom always work on the weekends? Yeah, he shrugged. She works all the time. She has two jobs. He shrugged again, and I realized the shrugging was another one of his tics. I wondered how many different tics he had. What does your mom do? I asked. She's an ER, ER nurse. That's cool. I guess, Connor said, except I never get to see her. I'm sorry. I didn't know what else to say, so I walked up to the porch of the soda shop and sat down in one of the rocking chairs. Connor sat beside me. I tried to think of something else to talk about. My mom took me to this cool instrument museum yesterday. Have you ever been there? 
Connor shook his head. I don't get out much. Do you play any instruments? He shook his head again and barked. No. I waited for him to ask me if I did. He didn't, and I figured it was because he assumed I couldn't. I play. I hadn't meant to say it with quite so much sass. He looked surprised again, of course. Why were people always surprised I could do stuff? I bet I'd get surprised looks if I told people I could breathe air without help or swallow my food or pee in the toilet. What do you play? He asked. Guitar. With your feet? No, with my belly button. Connor's eyes widened and then he pursed his lips in a little smirk. You're joking again, aren't you? Yes, I play with my feet, not my belly button. Awesome, he said, rocking in his chair and blinking his eyes rapidly. He did look impressed. Play for me something, sometime. I've got to see you play with your feet. I shifted in my seat. Um, sure. I didn't tell him I also wrote my own music and sang. In fifth grade, I had come to the realization that it was far more productive for me to channel my creative storytelling into songwriting than to only use it to shock people with morbid horror stories about my armlessness. I had written several songs since then. Most of them were pretty bad, like Take a Nice Pick to Your Own Ears ad, a song I wrote about learning how to put my first bra on immediately comes to mind. A couple were possibly worth playing, but the only people I'd ever played for were my parents. Do you ever see your dad? I asked him. His expression turned somber, and I was instantly sorry I had asked. Not much. That's too bad. I rocked in my chair beside him. He and my mom used to fight about me all the time. He looked out at Main Street as he spoke. He didn't understand why I couldn't just hold my ticks in. It made him angry. He always said to me, Connor, why don't you just knock it off? Look at how upset you're making us. Just stop it. And my therapy bills were expensive and my dad didn't want to pay for them anymore. He wanted me just to take the meds and stop ticking, but they made me feel awful. I think my dad would have done anything to just stop my ticks. And when he realized they weren't going to stop, he couldn't deal with it. So we left. I'm sure your parents had problems that had nothing to do with you or your tics, I said, thinking Connor's dad sounded like a real jerk. All their fights were always about me, my tics, my bills. I can see why they can't stand me. I can't stand myself most of the time. I wish I could hold the tics in and pretend to be normal. I didn't know what to say to that. I was sure Connor was wrong about his parents. I couldn't imagine parents being like that. I'm sorry. I wish I could grow arms and pretend to be normal. The corner of his mouth tipped up a little. I still don't completely understand why you can't hold your ticks in. I know you said it hurts, but why? Connor thought for a minute. It's like when you have a bad cough. You know, when you get that tickle in your throat and you really want to cough, you can concentrate really hard on holding it in, but it's so uncomfortable and eventually you just have to cough. That's what it feels like to not tick. Like this painful feeling in my chest builds and goes up to my throat until I just have to bark or it builds in my eyes and just till I have to blink to relieve it. And then it builds again and again. It never goes away for long. It always builds again. Oh, I said, that's really weird. Why does it do that? Connor shrugged. It's some kind of malfunction in my brain. Can you get brain surgery? Connor laughed. That seems a little extreme. I guess they could do surgery, but only if the Tourette's is super bad and dangerous. I can live with mine, so I'm not going to do any brain surgery. That would be scary. Yeah, I guess that would be pretty risky. I grinned at him. I don't think I would do an arm transplant, even if it were possible. Could have some scary side effects. Connor raised his eyebrows. Oh, yeah? What kind of scary side effects? 
like, what if the arms came from a serial killer and they just had to keep killing people even on someone else's body? Or the arms were too dead and then I had these zombie arms attached to my body. Too dead? Yeah, or what if they had naked lady tattoos all over them? Or if they had, like, a terrible nail fungus that slowly spread and took over my whole body? Uh, you've thought about this a lot. I sighed. You, know, you have to think about these things in case the opportunity ever arises. I glanced over at the petting zoo and saw Spaghetti sticking his mutant head over the fence. I wondered if he was looking for me. I visited him several times a day to pet him with my foot and tell him how adorable he was for his self-esteem. Since none of the other kids wanted to pet him, I felt like it was my sole responsibility to improve his ego. Come on, I said, sitting up from my rocker. I want you to meet someone. Connor followed me across the street. I stopped when I reached Spaghetti and nuzzled my face to his. This is Spaghetti. Connor patted Spaghetti's head without flinching. He's cute. A spaghetti is a mutant, I said, kissing his head, like me. You shouldn't say that about yourself. Connor gave me a stern look like he was my dad. Well, I didn't mean a creepy mutant, I said. We're like cool X-Men mutants. Connor smiled. Oh, well, then that's okay. We left spaghetti and walked back to the soda shop. Henry stepped out onto the porch. I thought I saw you out here, Avon, he said. Hi, Henry, I said. This is my friend, Connor. I felt a little warm fuzzy in my chest when I used the words, my friend. Henry smiled at Connor and then turned back to me. Y'all ready for the next rodeo? I glanced at Connor. I am not going to be in any rodeo. Henry laughed. But that'll be the day, he said. A rodeo without Avon? Well, say hi to Joe for me. He started to walk back inside. I don't know any Joe, I called to Henry. Do you know Joe? Henry just chuckled again and did that same little hand wave like he had when I told him I didn't know anything about tarantulas. You're such a joker, he said, and then he turned and went back into the soda shop. That was weird, Connor said. Who's Joe? I don't know, I said. The owner of the park's name is Joe Cavanaugh, but I guess no one ever sees him or seems to know anything about him. The accountant told my parents he never visits the park. I leaned in and lowered my voice. And get this, pictures of the Cavanaugh's in the museum have been removed. That is strange, Connor said. I wonder why. I don't know. I found this old storage shed behind some buildings, though. It was it has seven do not enter signs on it and an old broken handle that was padlocked. I couldn't get the doors open, but you might be able to. You want to try? Connor nodded excitedly. Yeah, let's go. I led him down a short trail until we reached the old wooden shed. It looked like it was on the verge of collapse, much like several of the other buildings at the park. See all the signs, I said? Cool, I wonder what's in there. After a few tugs and grunts, Connor was able to slide the door open enough that we could squeeze through the opening. I scraped my nose a bit on the old wooden door, and I hope I didn't get any splinters in my face. Getting them out wouldn't be fun. Connor and I looked around at the stacks of boxes, the piles of junk, the shelves stuffed with old books and papers and props. Where do we even begin? I said. I looked up and saw a box perched on top of one of the old bookshelves. The writing on it was faded and water-stained, but I could just barely make out three letters. A, V, a water-stained space, and then an N. Check out that box up there, I told Connor. He looked up and read the letters. A, V, N. We stood a moment in silence before Connor barked, startling me. Avon, he cried. I snorted. Of course not, Avon. I thought for a moment. Kavanaugh. Oh, right. 
Connor smacked himself in the head. Stupid. He stared at it a while. How do we get it down? I looked around the room for a ladder or something. I could try headbutting it off the shelf, I said. Connor laughed. If we can find something for me to stand on, I think I can get it down. We found a little table covered in old documents in one corner of the room. Connor moved the papers off it and dragged the table to the bookshelf. He climbed up and brought the box down, then placed it on the table and opened it. This stuff is old, he said, pulling out a book that looked like it had been soaked in water and left to dry out in the heat repeatedly. Though it was badly damaged, we could make out the big, hairy tarantula on the cover. More tarantula stuff, I mumbled, studying the cover. What's the deal with tarantula stuff, Connor asked. Something here was really into them. There are tarantula pictures in the soda shop and a tarantula display in the museum. Connor pulled out another book, a sketchbook. The pages made brittle, crinkling sounds as Connor turned them. Careful, I told him as a corner of one page broke off. We studied the sketches. There were several drawings of horses and stagecoach paths, and of course, of tarantulas. There was also a detailed sketch of a necklace with a blue stone in it. Connor pointed at the date on one of the pictures, 1973. Someone made these over 40 years ago, he said. We looked through the rest of the box and found some horse figurines, an old hairbrush, and a glass case that reminded me of an aquarium. Why would there be an aquarium of all things in here, I said. He shook his head. Maybe it's for something else. I carefully turned the fragile pages of the sketchbook with my toes and stopped on a sketch of a tarantula. It was quite lifelike. Someone had spent a lot of time sketching every tiny hair on each of the eight legs. Someone who clearly had a serious interest in these giant spiders. I think you're right. Okay, so there we go. End of chapter 10. Wow, tarantulas. I've got to say that I do not really particularly care for spiders. You know, we had that book in the library that says I'm trying to like spiders. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to like spiders, but I'm not even sure I could ever like a tarantula. Those things are just ugly hairy. But there seems to be some weird connection. And what did you think when you saw those letters A, V, N on the box? Were you thinking the same thing I was thinking? Yeah, I was thinking Avon. I was thinking, well, that's weird. How did they know Ava, a girl named Avon, was going to come live here? So, I mean, she is saying that it's Kavanaugh. So A, B, N, and I guess the A would be in between the V and the N. So maybe partly, but it is sort of weird. And, um, and what about the character? Let's go back. What about the character Henry? First of all, he thinks, what's up? He's always saying this stuff to Avon, like he knows Avon. And really, he's only just met her recently. He thinks she likes tarantulas. He thinks that she's going to be in a rodeo and ride some bucking horses. And he also thinks she knows someone named Joe. The only person she even knows that's named Joe is Mr. Joe Cavanaugh, who's the owner, but she's never met him. There is something going on that we don't know yet. And I don't think it's just because Henry's older and he's sort of forgetful. I think, I don't know. I think there's a mystery. Does Avon resemble somebody? Does she look like someone that Henry used to know? Somebody that liked tarantulas and liked to be in a rodeo? I don't know. Well, what did you think when she first, when Avon was painting with her dad and then she saw Connor walking over the bridge to the park? How do you think she felt? What do you think her emotions were? Yeah, I think she was like so excited. Like finally she had someone that was coming to see her. And it was sort of a big deal because Connor had told her that he didn't really go anywhere. You know, he doesn't go outside the house much. 
mostly, why do you think he doesn't go out to public place as much? Yeah, it's probably because he feels a little uncomfortable. People think that he's making fun of them when he barks or they don't understand the ticks. And it's just like super hard and probably awkward to have to explain it to everybody you meet. Um, so it's probably easier just to either hang out at home or like hang out with friends who already know you and accept you. So the fact that he's going to see Avon has made that um, he's decided to go out and walk across to see her sort of means like he's considering her a friend, that she's accepted him and vice versa with him. I know, pretty cool. I do like their humor. <laughs> When, they, when she was talking about the, what it looked like when you um, put your head through one of the round circles for the wooden picture board. Um, yeah, she's got a funny sense of humor. So, and also it appears that uh, maybe the person who this box of items belonged to, they were um, a bit of an artist because they had a sketchbook in it. Um, anyway, we're going to be moving on to chapter 11 next. Uh, happy reading on your own, but thank you for um, joining me in the 10th chapter of Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus. See you next time. Bye.